the Chin Hills are slowly coming to life. In the morning mist, five brothers rush to their wooden cart. They are between 6 and 13 years old, but it's been several years since the cart was anything but a work tool. The Chin brothers deliver wood to the villagers. We carry up to half a ton. It's very steep here, and the brakes aren't reliable, so we use branches to block the wheels. You see, these are my brakes. It's the pedal that's connected to the brake with this uh, chain. Their father made the cart as best he could. Yet there are brakes, a steering wheel, axles, and real car tires. <laughs> I've never had an accident, but my friends have. Their wheels fell off and they smashed their carts. There are a lot of accidents here. The three-kilometer journey downhill is anything but safe. It's dangerous and it's scary. On the turns, the trucks can't see us, and it's very difficult to avoid them. Shaken and rattled by potholes, the cart risks disintegrating at any moment. The wood will sell for two euros, barely enough for a few meals. During the monsoon, the roads in Burma can quickly turn into raging torrents of mud and stones. It's slippery, really slippery. Take the plank right now. When it rains, there's a risk of landslides. It's a challenge for man and machine. That's how we do things. It gets fixed and fixed again, and then we drive off. My body aches all over. I'm exhausted. Burma is the land of 1,000 pagodas, a Buddhist stronghold, and a country isolated for 50 years by its communist dictatorship. Its long hidden sites and people are among the last in the world to be open up to foreigners, such as the giraffe women. I'll never remove my rings. I like them a lot. Below the ground in Burma lie untold riches, including petrol in the depths of the jungles. You've seen the quality of my petrol. Mandalay is the capital of the north. Population one million, the country's second largest city. Kosomo, aged 43, has been stuck in traffic jams for an hour and a half. Since the end of the dictatorship, the number of cars and motorbikes has increased dramatically. Look, the motorbikes are coming like that, yeah? So, I have to be careful, yeah? 
the road is very narrow and that's a backing area on the right side too, so we cannot drive well, yeah? Cosimo is a guide and is looking to find a new tourist circuit. While the military were in charge, most of the country, with a few exceptions, was out of bounds to foreigners. I'm going to is a northern country. What the tourists never been there yet. Now it's become better. We can have the permission and we can go. He'll travel about 500 kilometers along one of the worst roads in Southeast Asia. It crosses the north of the country, the Chin Mountains, to reach Ridil Lake on the Indian border, the final destination. It's pure adventure, as Kosomo has no idea what lies ahead. Squeeze in next to him in the dead man's seat is Nini, the co-pilot. Wait, the motorbike's heading straight for us. A bit more. Not now. Okay. Driving in Burma requires a cool head, as only the passenger can see what's coming. There's a car. And all because 40 years ago, the Burmese dictator decided, on his astrologer's advice, that everyone would no longer drive on the left, but on the right. You see, the wheel is on my, on my right side. I have to pass. I have to pass this truck up from the left, but I cannot see. So I need someone. If I have to drive alone, alone myself, yeah, like that, I cannot. It's very dangerous or take long time. There's a car. There's a car. The dictator's astrologer forgot one detail, however. The cars are imported from Singapore, which drives on the left. Okay, go slowly now. We can overtake. There's nothing. Is that okay now? Come on. Okay, go on. There's nobody. Now. It's taken almost 40 minutes to get past the truck. In six hours, Kosomo has covered just 60 kilometers. He wants to look at an elephant reserve, which is at the end of this small road. No asphalt here, just a dirt track, and there's trouble straight away. Nini has to check the depth. I have to follow him, yeah? Yes. He showed me where to drive. The monsoon is just beginning in Burma. It lasts three months from June to September. We are lucky now because no, no rain, dry, less water, so that yeah, we can keep driving on this road, yeah? But their luck soon changes. 300 meters further up, a small brook has become a large river. Is there a lot of water there? You mean it comes up to the waist? Yes. Really? Can my car get across? I'm not from the village. Ask that man there. Can my car make it? Yes, this way. Where? Can you guide me across? And today we have to do quicker because it's look raining sooner or later because there is a cloudy a lot. So if we have the rain later, it might be have more water problem. Torrential rain will make the river impassable. But it's the only way to the elephant sanctuary. Kosomo has no choice. So you'll have to find a solution. The town of Kalemyo lies 200 kilometers to the northwest.
for half a century no foreigner ever came here. The town was frozen in time. The cars here date from the Second World War. A jumble of trucks from another age. Amongst the rusting, clanking parts, some spanking new jeeps. These are unique, entirely handmade in workshops such as Mr. Chin's. He's crazy about mechanics. With a dozen other workers, he can make anything. The clutch, suspension, bodywork, all except the engine, which comes from India. It takes us about three months to build the frame and then put the motor in. At that rate, Mr. Chin's workshop can produce just nine Jeeps a year. But at 12,000 euros, they're a great deal less expensive than imported vehicles, and they're virtually puncture-proof. Japanese four-wheel drives look nice, but they're expensive and not suitable for our roads, as well as not having enough room to transport things. Our Jeeps, though, are well-made, strong, simple. They're built to handle the climate and the road conditions. Once a week in Moniwa, like in every town in Burma, trainee Buddhists go begging. The custom is that people will give them food and money. Onko is too busy repairing his truck and doesn't notice them. Give me some pliers. Onko is just 25 and already owns his small transport company. His only possession is this pile of rusting metal, twice as old as he is, and which, by some miracle, still works. I bought this truck two years ago now. I've changed every piece since then, one after another, when I could afford it. The truck is very old, it's more than 50 years old now. I want to buy another one, but I can't afford it. A new one would cost four or five times as much. So I gradually change parts to keep it running. Careful, don't hurt yourself. OK, take the belt out. I'll lower the box. Give me a wedge to keep it there. Unko has removed the engine to repair the clutch and the gearbox. OK, it's moving. It's frustrating work. Every time he dismantles one piece, he finds another problem. About 15 parts need repairing. It will take all day to get the truck working again. I know my truck isn't the most attractive thing. It doesn't have a nice paint job, but at least it works well. The next day, he leaves at sunrise. I pray to Buddha, and for my parents too. I really think it helps me make my journey without trouble. 
And that's why every time I'm about to leave, it's the first thing I do. On each journey, his truck becomes his home, where he spends part of his life. Like at home, he removes his shoes before getting in. I don't wear shoes out of respect for the truck. We Buddhists believe anything that helps you live is beneficial. The truck allows me to live, so it's a benefactor. So I never wear shoes in the cabin or even in the trailer. And besides, if I did wear shoes, I wouldn't be able to feel the pedals, would I? Unko will travel 220 kilometers to reach Kalemio to pick up a cargo of wood. The trouble on this road is the number of rival truck drivers. If he's late arriving, he'll need to wait his turn. And losing time means losing money. To remain competitive, he'll try a new route, a shortcut he's never driven before. Which way is it now? Ah, this way is best. He's been told the shortcut will save him two hours. But first, he needs to cross this bridge. Ni Yung, his co-pilot, considers their options. I'm afraid the tunnel's too low for the truck. That's why I'll guide him. It's a matter of inches. But there's no choice, and this time, the spirits are against him. The roof's stuck under the bridge. We can't go forward, we'll have to reverse. Onko has to turn back, but his troubles are only just beginning. His ancient truck doesn't have front-wheel traction, and he ends up in the ditch. The front wheel is stuck fast in the mud. Well, I'll try and get it out. Try as they might together, it's impossible. They'll need help. Can you help? My front wheel's stuck. Hang on, I'll get a cable to pull you out. Reverse. And tell him to stay on the left-hand side of the road. To the left, to the left, go on. Okay, stop. Shortcuts are great for saving time, but not always. In fact, his shortcut has cost him two hours. Camped out by the river, Kosomo, the tourist guide, is still looking for a way across. He tries his luck. How much is it for the motorbike? 20 centimes. 
And for the car? The car? Ah, well. <laughs> we'll cross on the rafts, but they're just taking motorbikes for now. The raft's pilots have to go in the water. If the current's too strong or if it's too deep, they won't cross. He sends out his co-pilot to scout ahead. Are there rocks below? Nini, are there rocks? No, it's sand. It is a less water, but the problem is the ground. The ground is a no stone. It is uh, only sand and muddy. So sometimes, if you lose the way, your car can be stuck inside. We cannot move at all. Two locals offer up a solution. They know the terrain and also know there's a narrow passage. It's the only place where the water is not too deep and the ground firm enough to bear the weight of a car. It's okay, and yeah, now we have the full week. It's working well. This rain, this weather, this road, yeah. We need to have the full week. Otherwise, uh, we can't do it, yeah. Cosimo is not far from the elephant park. There are about 10,000 elephants in Burma. Here, the animals live peacefully alongside man. Yet sometimes, something snaps and the situation can change in an instant. One elephant is causing panic among the farmers. Look at that, the scale of the elephant. So the cattle over there, they took, they pulled the cut away. They're trying to run away from the elephant, near from the elephant, and you see, it's an accident. Half of all the elephants in Burma are domesticated. Inside Kasapa Park, run by the government, there are about 30 living more or less freely. Each elephant has its own name. That one, the little one, is two years old. The other is 34. It's a young female. She's called Silver Moon. Elephants and their drivers have an almost mystical relationship. We take very good care of them. They get a medical inspection every month. These elephants are calm and friendly, but they used to be very wild. We feed them. They used to hide out deep in the jungle, so it was hard to get them all the way here. They used to attack humans. While most Burmese elephants work in the forest, those in Kasapa are lucky. For decades now, they've been protected from modern civilization. They said, yeah, they never seen the tourists. And this is what I like, yeah? Then I would like to bring some tourists in here, and I hope, yeah, more and more tourists in here. How I'm happy people communicate to the other people too. If Cosimo gets to bring tourists to the Kasapa Reserve, the elephant's peaceful existence will likely change. There is one place in Burma where the horizon separates water and sky. 
It's Lake Inlay. Not far away to the south, close to the border with Thailand, is the small community of Rangu. A village in the middle of nowhere. It's home to the Padang, an exceptional people. They're probably better known as the giraffe women, and they number just a few hundred. They don't even speak Burmese. And so to communicate, help from the local school teacher is needed. Modu is 28. She never had a choice. From the age of eight, she was a giraffe woman. After giving birth to her second child six months earlier, she was allowed to remove her neck coils for a short time. But the time has come to put them back on. This woman will help. Some believe the unusual coils were meant as protection against tigers. Others claim it makes the women more beautiful. In truth, no one really knows. But one thing is certain. Mordu has no choice in the matter. Don't make it too tight. Now it's hard to twist the metal by hand. And then they have to be nice and round, properly shaped. It takes two hours to make a beautiful coil. Modu was used to living without the restrictive coils and now finds it difficult to cope with the brass rings again. She has six kilos of the metal around her neck, her wrists and her ankles. When you first wear the rings, it's not good. You get a neck ache, and then you get used to it, and it doesn't hurt anymore. But it's hard to go to the toilet, for example. It's not practical, with all the coils around your legs. As each ring is added, it's like a noose tightening around her. Careful, you're hurting me. You're pulling too tight. Modu is close to tears. Oh, it burns. When you work every day, you have to wash your body. If not, dirt and sweat will collect. And with a brass, it can cause skin problems. The 16th ring is placed around her neck. Some giraffe women have as many as 28. I don't want my daughter to have the rings, but it's up to her to decide whether she wants them or not. Soon nobody will have them. So I'd rather she didn't do it. Maie, however, is very proud of her coils. At 49, she's one of the oldest giraffe women in the region. My grandmother had them, and I thought she looked beautiful. The first time I had them on, it was very painful. But I don't know, I, I liked them and wanted more. <laughs> I'll never take them off. I like them a lot. I want to die with them on. In these remote parts of Burma, the giraffe women of Rangu are the last to carry on the tradition. is just halfway to Kalemio. Mm. 
It's tough. You need a lot of power, and you have to be strong. Driving in these conditions makes me ache, especially my arms. Turning the wheel, changing gears, you need strength for that. He's taken another route again, which, in theory, should make up the time he lost earlier. In theory. That's the way we need to go. Down there. And it's very slippery. Keep coming, keep coming. Me, I didn't want to be a full-time driver. My passion was art, music. I'd have loved to have composed songs and play music. I tried hard, but for the sake of the family, I had to become a driver. On Anko's old truck, the engine's ticking over nicely the shock absorbers gave up the ghost a long time ago. Worn out by all the shaking and bumps, Anko is exhausted. My body aches all over. My back hurts, of course, for sitting all the time and driving over bumps. But it's my arms that really hurt. Actually, it hurts everywhere. Fatigue gets the better of him, and Anko takes a rest. He doesn't even have the strength to wait for lunch. Anko has recovered, but he's also wasted 40 minutes. He's determined to arrive before nightfall. Another eight hours to go. A few kilometers further on, the mud makes the road inaccessible. Especially to trucks. This one's from Calemio, which is where Anko is heading. He asks for news, and the driver advises him not to take this route. This road is hell. I lost a tyre and had to replace it. With all the turns and mud, the tyres don't last for long. I was stuck for four or five days. There are cars that have broken down and others that have been submerged. You can really get stuck. Once again, Anko has to find another way. Keep going. But on the very first turn, there's trouble.
Already with your own weight you sink, so you can imagine with a truck. I can't see any cars. If you get bogged down here, it could be for a month. And it's worse if it rains. I think we ought to start up again. Nini, walk along. No, it's no good. Unko turns back. He's reluctantly rejoining the main road. He doesn't want to take any more risks, and once again a shortcut costs him precious time. As he reaches Calemio, journey's end, it's almost dark, and the competition is already here. Now I need to register at the cargo office, so I can load up when it's my turn. You never know how long that will take. The delay can drag on for a day, even two or three, before he can load up with the timber. If all goes well, he'll earn 250 euros, enough to provide for his family for several weeks. The forest is one of Burma's natural riches. The country has among the greatest resources anywhere on the planet. Minerals, precious stones, gas, and oil. A makeshift camp has been set up in the stifling heat of the Burma jungle. About 15 years ago, small fields of easily extractable oil were discovered here. An old motor, patched up with some cables, is all it takes to look for the black gold. It lies just 200 meters below ground. People from all over Burma have come looking for it. Amongst them, Mr. Fengi. I used to be able to get 40 liters of petrol a day, but it's become less and less. Now it's just 8 liters a day. Mr. Fengi used to deal in precious stones before the market declined, so he's invested all his savings in oil. I invested in labor and machinery, in equipment, food, everything. I sell my petrol and my employees get a fixed wage. I invested 800 euros in two years, and thanks to oil I've made my money back. Now, you've seen the quality of my petrol. You can put it straight into the engine. Hardly need to refine it at all. There isn't enough oil to interest the big multinationals or the state, and they leave it for the people to reap the benefits. Thousands make a living from this cottage industry. Once extracted, the crude oil is stocked in 25-litre barrels, which are fastened onto motorbikes and delivered to the refinery. I've loaded about 25 litres on my motorbike. If it's dry and the road's good, I won't fall off. With his explosive cargo, the tanker biker has 15 hazardous kilometers to the nearest wholesaler. He earns 2,500 Burmese kyats for each trip, about two euros. The oil is then transported to Moriwa, the closest town. This is the refinery. 
No chimneys, no giant reservoirs, just petrol cans. The owner insists his product is as good as any of the big companies and much cheaper. Our petrol is sold all over Burma. We deliver it everywhere, even to the big cities, such as Yangon and Mandalay. A lot of people use our petrol. Production is basic. The petrol is heated in a large vat. As it heats up, the crude oil turns into gas and, when cooled, resumes its liquid form. The lighter it is, the better its quality. Look at the color, it's yellow. But soon it will become clean and clear. It's good petrol and we'll refine it still further. The small refinery can produce up to 20,000 tons of petrol a month. It will sell for about 75 cents a litre, twice as cheap as in Europe. A mist has come down on the small road in the Chin Hills Mountains. Cosimo is just 20 kilometers from his final destination. He can barely make out the edge of the ravine, not to mention the road made slippery by the constant rain. We cannot see what, uh, what the cart is coming from the other side because um, some of the tents are really, you know, helping tan and uh, we cannot see from one to another side, yeah? A kilometre further on, one driver was nearly killed when his truck almost fell into the ravine. I was making my turn right here when the clutch and the brakes gave way. The engine stopped suddenly. And that's why, well, that's why my truck ended up like this. I skidded and almost went over the edge. At the summit of the hill, the mist is even thicker, and the danger can come from up above. The ground is not really strong enough, and the land can be fell down and the car can be uh, have been the accident too. Like convicts in a chain gang, the repair crews attack the rocks with sledgehammers. It's a titanic task, as just a few hundred meters away, the mountain has spilt over onto the road, which is now completely blocked. cars are here, those, this kind of the cars uh, are blocked and on the other side too, some of the cars, our cars are coming here and they all were blocked. Yeah? A few diehards try and get through. Some of them on two wheels.
they never know how long that they have to wait for. So everybody is taking the risk. Cosimo is one of the last to get through. The mountain fog is finally lifting. Towards late morning, Cosimo reaches the village of Zozan. It's the last stop before Redil Lake. The villagers are surprised. It's the first time they've seen foreigners. So this area has uh, seemed to be open very recently, so that yeah, they, they don't see tourists or they never seen the tourists. So what I think is uh, if we can bring the, some more tourists, yeah, I think yeah, people would be happy to see. But the only problem is uh, how to be here. The road is uh, really difficult. <laughs> And there's one more obstacle to opening the region up to tourism. Beyond the village, the road is a thick carpet of mud. You have to move the plates. We've already tipped over several times, three times I think. Luckily we weren't hurt. We raised the truck back onto its wheels and then we carried on. We do whatever it takes. The iron plates can go under the tyre so we can get through. We'll reposition them and drive on. Take the plate now. plate. Put it on this side. The gearbox is broken. We can't get our four-wheel drive to work. We'll have to take off the ball joints and reposition them properly. And then we'll be off. That's how we do things here. We fix things over and over again, and then we can drive. <laughs> With his four-wheel drive, Cosimo manages to get through. Redil Lake is only 20 kilometers away. But the further he goes, the worse the conditions become. And now, it also threatens to rain. If it rains, how's the road? <laughs> well, you just have to cope. In the end, Cosimo gives up. The road is going to be getting worse and worse, yeah? Okay, I decided, yeah? I think yeah, it's not better to go to the lake, yeah? Because I'm not sure about the road, how bad it is to... Now we are going back to the somewhere to stay. We are not going to the lake. Sorry for that. Cosimo and his co-pilot didn't reach their objective. But maybe it's for the best. It was Mother Nature's call. And at least some of Burma's treasures will be preserved for just a little longer. <laughs>